Hi everybody. Uh, hope everyone's had a good couple of weeks since uh, my last video. Uh, today I'm going to work on answering uh, the question about, and I'm going to butcher his name throughout it, uh, Gerasimov, <laughs> Gerasimov doctrine. So yeah, let's just get right into it. Uh, the speed and efficiency Russian forces and partisans used to gain control of Crimea in the Donbas region of Ukraine in 2014 and 15 was incredible. Major Amos Franks of the U.S. Army said in his paper, Hybrid Warfare, the 21st Century Russian Way of Warfare, Russia is seeking to bring about a new era of geopolitics to reshape the global balance of power and to dip, <clears throat> excuse me, tip the balance of power in its favor. In order to do this, Russia has recognized a new means of exploiting their enemies' vulnerabilities needed. Uh, they, they recognize that a new means of exploiting their enemies' vulnerabilities needed to be mastered. Drawing from experiences in the post-Soviet conflicts of Transnistria, Chechnya, and Georgia, General Valery Gerasimov, sorry again, uh, wrote a short paper in February 2013 describing the evolving character of war in relation to evolving techno technology, international policy, stately, and international relations. St excuse me, st strategy and international relations, according to Major Fox. This doctrine became a springboard for the Russian government for approaching conflicts in the years to come, and it could present some challenges for the U.S. government in potential future conflicts. Through the Gerasimov doctrine, though, excuse, sorry, though the Gerasimov doctrine seemed innovative, perhaps even prophetic, given the conflict that would happen in Ukraine soon after its writing, it is possible this doctrine is not as unique and new as people thought. In Charles K. Bartle's 2016 paper, Getting... Gerasimov right. He writes about how the Russians may be taking the U.S. playbook and expanding on it slightly. Bartles explains in the minds of many Russians the U.S. government post-Soviet Union has established a pattern of forced regime change by interfering in places like Yugoslavia and Afghanistan in the 1990s. Of course, the American government framed these interventions as necessary to decrease the needless loss of human lives as, and as a humanitarian effort and not a desire for regime, regime change. Now, Bartles goes on, rather than an overt military invasion, the U.S. begins their attacks by gaining political opposition using state propaganda like CNN and BBC, the Internet and social media and non-government organizations, uh, for example, humanitarian aid organizations. While Gerasimov intimates in his, uh, which Gerasimov intimates is the beginning of hybrid warfare. So from the Russian perspective, it is possible to see the patterns emerging in U.S. tactics. Bartles explained thus the stance Gerasimov takes in his paper on the future of Russian warfare. In reading Gerasimov's original paper, the value of science is in the foresight. The new challenges demand, new challenges demand rethinking the forms and methods of carrying out combat operations. He states, the very rules of war have changed. The role of non-military means achieving political and strategic goals has grown, and in many cases, they have exceeded the power of force of weapons in their effectiveness. Gerasimov's paper and Bartle's assessment of it demonstrate not only a new way of thinking regarding military tactics, but an obvious embrace of foresight and forward thinking. This presents a challenge for the U.S., if Russia begins to outpace us in innovation in terms of tactics, procedures, strategy, equipment, and so on. Uh, for instance, in Major Amos's excellent summary of the Ukrainian conflict, he describes how Russia learned from its military shortcomings in Georgia and adjusted its military strategy, operational approach, and tactics. Russia learned that conscript soldiers were unreliable and their deaths brought social and political instability. Therefore, it needed professional shoulder, so, excuse me, sol, soldiers in its combat formations. Russia learned that getting stuck in an overt stalemate without plausible deniability created unnecessary political pressure. Thus, it must obscure their actions to the highest possible degree and conduct operations to destabilization, de, excuse me, destabilize its opponents well before the commitment of ground forces. And finally, and I'm still quoting from Major Amos, Finally, Russia learned in order to not get bogged down, they must devise methods of fighting that disaggregate strike capabilities from strategic and operational headquarters. The U.S. still relies on volunteers uh, for their military, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, um, many of which do not make a career of the military. 
If presented with heavily trained, experienced, and motivated Russian soldiers, the current U.S. model of short-term non, uh, non-drafted fighting forces may not be enough to stem the tide. They just don't have the, the means to train everybody to that level, if that's what we're, we're looking at. Um, and, and that brings me into my next point of, we're not necessarily as prepared for that style of fighting. Uh, for instance, as I, men- uh, as I mentioned, the current U.S. military may not be prepared. Uh, in the Defense News video featuring Philip Carber of the Potomac Foundation, he discussed the differences in Russian tactics he observed in the Ukraine during that conflict. He specifically pointed out how the Russians used electronics to suppress communications and cue targeting in the region. Unmanned aerial vehicles also played a large role in the tactics. He pointed out that drones were almost constantly overhead, predominantly used for targeting for delivery of firestorm-type weapons. It should be noted the Russians employed 16 types of drones in their new style of warfare, Carver said, where the U.S. military only employs a few. Through the use of drones, the Russians uh, developed were able to use precision targeting, then mass fire strategies, where the U.S. would, for example, where the U.S. would deploy one round per tank. Uh, the Russians will have an entire battery or battalion with rocket launchers to literally just decimate their target. Carver expressed concern the military may be too general in its training and equipment to be effective against the new Russian method of conducting warfare. And while I've spent the majority of this video speaking on military tactics and the need to be prepared for new methods of attack, Uh, There is a second side of hybrid war, which includes information and cyber warfare. In Gerasimov's paper, he expresses the need to engage in warfare not only in the physical spaces, but in in the information spaces as well. As demonstrated by the Sony hacks in 2014 and the election meddling in 2016, done by North Korea and Russia respectively, Americans are particularly susceptible to disinformation campaigns and cyber threats, due in large part to our, our connectivity as a whole. We rely so heavily on on the internet and cyber that that also is a great thing, but it also makes us quite vulnerable. In the video, The Weaponizing of Social Media, Peter Singer spoke about how each person is a distributor of information, almost like we own our, we each own our own newspaper. Whether, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of vetting as to whether (laughs) that information is always true. Um, There is a like war, singer's term, going on in an effort to hack people on these networks and literally influence their thinking. Based on the recent incidents in Ukraine and Crimea, it can be understood that these tactics are an attempt, excuse me, to develop or foster rifts between the American people and it's between the American people as a whole and foster mistrust between the American people and their government. One of the main, which is one of the main characteristics of hybrid warfare. And in closing, Gerasimov's doctrine with its warfare on a variety of fronts will present a unique set of challenges to the U.S. if we do not continue with our efforts to learn and innovate. The Russian examples in Ukraine and Crimea, in addition to Gerasimov's writings, present the U.S., however, with the means to maintain our dominance in the world if we learn from it. Thank you.